Good evening, everybody, and welcome. This is the end of our Galatians study. We'll be taking some time off after this. Uh, as, as of now, um, the church is uh, still closed. We are hoping that we will be reopened for Sunday, but we will uh, not know for sure until tomorrow. Um, we'll get a phone call. We'll get an email out to you all and let you know. So um, we are going to close up this evening. If you are at home and if you did your reading, um, and if you have questions, you can, of course, type them in as we go and you can ask and that would be that'd be perfectly all right um this is one of those weeks where we'll watch the video um but i think you would have gotten a whole lot more if you'd done the reading throughout the week i thought the reading was a little more penetrating and and got to the nitty-gritty of the text a lot better i think than the video will but we will watch the video anyway um because that's that's 10 minutes uh, and i'm i'm cheap and i paid for those 10 minutes so We'll, we'll take them and watch them. So. Say hello to the males. Oh, hey, Tommy and John. Good to see you this evening. I'm glad you are here. All righty. I'm going to start the video. Anybody else say it popped in? Yeah, but I can't see their pictures well enough. Okay. <laughs> With this week's readings, we have completed a close study of Paul's letter to the Christians in Galatia. This is a text that shows us a great deal about the heart of the Apostle Paul, one of the most influential voices in Christian history. We heard his own testimony concerning how his encounter with the glorified Christ changed his whole understanding of God's provision for righteousness and the whole direction of Paul's life. We heard his passion for his converts born of his deep love for them and his deep desire to see God's work in them completed. As he put it, to see Christ formed in them. We heard a great deal of how he understood his integrity to have been established throughout his life as a follower and proclaimer of Christ and his good news. It is a text that shows us something of the messy business of trying to discern the direction in which the truth of the gospel would lead the church. Paul's visits to Jerusalem, the incident at Antioch, and the wavering of great figures like Peter and Barnabas, the mission of the rival teachers themselves, all of this reassures us in the midst of our attempts to discern that direction, that messy has been the norm in the discernment process from the beginning. Galatians is a text that gives us unshakable assurance, but perhaps not of the sort that we have been accustomed to hearing or even giving. At no point in this letter does Paul say, if at some point in your life you put your trust in Christ, you're all set for eternity. He does, however, assure us of Christ's love for us and Christ's investment in us. He assures us of God's good pleasure to give us God's Holy Spirit, to welcome us into God's own family. He assures us that the Holy Spirit is more than up for the challenge of setting in order the unruly wills and affections of sinful people, bringing Christ to life in and among us, leading us into righteousness. He assures us of a good end that God has appointed for those who persevere in this journey with Christ and with the Spirit. Eternal life, an inheritance in God's everlasting kingdom. It is also a text that lays out before us the challenge of the gospel, the call to respond to Christ's grace and to the gift of the Spirit as fully as God has invested himself in extending that grace 
and providing that gift. Our readings from this final week contributed largely to this facet of Galatians. Those who put themselves at the disposal of their sisters and brothers in Christ, offering themselves in loving service, fulfill the law of Moses as summed up in the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. In a parallel way, those who put themselves out to help their sisters and brothers bear their burdens, fulfill the law of Christ. Paul specifically names the burdens of succumbing to the flesh rather than walking consistently with the Spirit, in regard to which we need one another's help. How might we most effectively put this helpful advice into practice in our faith communities? John Wesley has handed down some models for us in this regard. A great deal of the advances in discipleship and holiness nurtured by his movement happened in the context of the small group meeting the core of which had to do precisely with identifying these specific burdens, supporting one another in prayer in regard to the same, and helping one another get back on track with the Spirit. Paul also calls us to vigilance in regard to the direction of our energies and investments of ourselves and our resources. He urges us to refrain from sowing to the flesh and to direct all our endeavors in the direction of sowing to the Spirit. Christ died to open up for us the gift of God's Holy Spirit, given to us to shape the direction of the remainder of our lives. As I read Galatians 6, 7 through 10, I can't help but remember the altar call at the end of Deuteronomy, the book that completes the statement of the regulations and instructions that made up the law of Moses. There we read, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not listen, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish, that you shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. In giving the law of Moses to the people of Israel, God put both life and death within their grasp and urged them to choose the path that would lead to life. Paul saw that there were a great many shifts that occur in regard to this plan with the coming of Christ, and we have looked at each of these in detail during the course of these eight weeks. Two shifts that do not occur, however, involve the following. First, God desires that his acts of grace and his promises of further grace lead God's people into a righteous life. Second, what we do with the life God has given us still carries consequences. God's grace in Christ does not mean that God's essential character has changed, nor that the moral order of God's universe is undone. Actions still matter, and consequences are not divorced from choices. God's grace in Christ does mean that we now have the indwelling Spirit of God to ensure that as we sow to the Spirit, as we value that best gift divine and allow it to have its full effect in us, we may live in a God-pleasing manner and, therefore, enjoy the end of a God-pleasing life, eternity in God's presence. 
Paul leaves us with his own example as our pattern to follow. He declares that his claim to honor comes from his having been crucified to the world and the world having been crucified to him through the cross of Jesus Christ. To borrow words from the title of a once popular book by N. Scott Peck, Paul knows that there is a world waiting to be born. If we are to make our way to that world, however, we must die with Christ to the current world and to the life it has fashioned for all of us. What matters is not the lines and divisions that seem to matter so much to this world and to the people who are still formed by and for this world. What matters is a new creation, the new person that the Spirit is creating you to be, the new community that the Spirit is creating us to be together. Here is yet another facet of that faith that delivers us, that receives Christ's rescue from the present evil age. This involves, first, faith that the new creation the Spirit yearns to bring to birth is far better than the world to which the Spirit would have us die. It involves, second, faithfulness to Christ and to the Spirit's leading, to go where they lead and give ourselves over entirely to becoming that new creation. As Paul closed his letter, so I would close my words to you. May the favor of our Lord Jesus Christ indeed remain with your spirit, my sisters and brothers. Amen. Hey, Sylvia, good to have you with us. All right, any questions? <laughs> Sorry, that's not fair. This week we get to where Blaine um, was last week. Uh, we get to the part where how do, you, how do you live with each other and how do you correct each other and, and how does that happen and what does that look like in a community of faith? So I wrote down some things. One of them is on, uh, on page 85, Last paragraph, one of the safeguards that God has put in place for each believer who might prove susceptible to the flesh. And when we talk about flesh, we're talking about what we talked about last week, right? We're talking about the thing that works in, the, in opposition to, um, to the spirit of God in our lives. There's a spirit of God which pulls us one way, and there is the flesh which pulls us, pulls us the other way. We're not necessarily talking about um, physical stuff, but we're talking about... Um, <clears throat> the weak link in the chain that doesn't get doesn't get renewed like the rest of the, the mind and spirit and soul. I'm sorry. So where were we? Who might prove susceptible to the flesh at one point or another is the intervention of the community of faith. So what Paul posits um, for growth in the book of Galatians at the end is the community of faith, and it becomes our responsibility. Paul is going to maintain to speak to speak the truth to each other in what in love, which you know is in Galatians, but I, I think that's fair to bring that in um, and, and to keep each other accountable to the Spirit and in the Spirit. So the question is, what does that what does that look like in the first couple of verses of the sixth chapter? Um, on the top of page eighty six, wanted to just share with you: many churchgoers are reluctant to cross that barrier. They are not reluctant, however, to talk among themselves about the sin someone else in the community has committed. The practice harms both the individual who has sinned and the community of faith. So let me just talk about the preferred method of dealing with sin in the churches that I, of course, have never served in 35 years. This is other churches do it this way. Nobody, no church I have ever served has ever had anybody in it who has ever chosen this method for dealing with people who are moving in contradiction to the spirit. The preferred method in churches is to talk about them with somebody else behind their back until you get everybody talking about it and everybody upset and then something explodes somewhere along the line. Now I am, um, I am a big one, and if there is a problem, and Paul will talk to us, and I wish I could, you don't remember, Blaine, where he tells you to go to talk to, if, if somebody sins against you, you go and you talk to that person. If not, you take your brother with you. 
I can't, I can't remember exactly where that is, and I probably should have looked it up because I knew this was coming. So that is my fault, and I take responsibility, and I will expect the community to hold me accountable next time. But <clears throat> I'm a big one that when there is a problem, you go to somebody and you talk to them about what that problem is and how you are offended or how they maybe, as you see it, deviating from the work of the Spirit. But we have a lot of passive aggressive tendencies inside the church, and we just have a lot of passivity inside the church. We don't want to be bothered. Um, your relationships wind up being stronger, I think, in the long run, if that is how you handle problems. If you don't handle problems like that, there are a, a whole series of unconscious messages that you send. And one of them is, is that you don't belong because you're not worth the trouble of me coming to you and talking to you. Um, it's not worth drawing you back into the group. We're just going to let you drift off until you go. The other one is, is that I'm being unreasonable and I'd rather gossip and talk about you behind your back, which means I don't really care for you at all. You're not, you're not worth it. And that's a, a wrong message, it seems to me, to be sending inside the community of faith, of faith. And Paul is saying that if we are bound by the Spirit and connected in the Spirit, then we also have a responsibility in the Spirit to go talk to somebody. So last week we talked about the hallmarks of that. And when you go to draw somebody back into fellowship with the Spirit, what is the diagnostic that Paul gives us in Galatians? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, and I skipped one. Um, anyway, um, so Diane Kofo, wherever you are, you need to come here and sing the song from summer camp for me because I don't remember all, all the words. We used to, oh my gosh, we used to sing that every year at camp. Um, those are the diagnostics. If you go to somebody to, you know, to, I don't even want to use the, conf, the word confront because that comes with so much baggage. But if you go to them and, and attempt to bring them back into, into union with the spirit and, and you are, you are all out angry and you're hot to trot and you're right. That's something else going on. That's, that's not love and concern. What Paul talks about in Galatians is you need to be willing to bear somebody else's burdens. And how I look at that is that your heart needs to break. If your heart doesn't break for the people who are caught in sin or who are um, distancing themselves from the fellowship with the Holy Spirit, if your heart doesn't break and a tear doesn't come to your eye, then you probably just need to be quiet. Now, I'll just be real honest about that. Um, I, think, I think Paul is talking about the kind of love that is willing to bear somebody else's burdens. And the reason you go to them is because you don't want them to be burdened with those kinds of things. So <clears throat> everybody knows the care song and cast all your cares. Well, that, that's wonderfully lovely and fluffy. But the verse that it comes from out of Galatians is, is very serious and it's very heavy. Um, we take our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ very, very seriously. Very, very seriously. So um, we bear each other's burdens. Um, and that is why we go and talk to them. Not because we're going to set the record straight. Not because we're going to make them do the right thing. Not because they're horrible people because they have done X, Y, and Z or any of that stuff. We do it because we love them and we understand the burden that they are under. And there is empathy. And our heart breaks for them. Am I making sense? Okay. Yeah, a big factor that may be missing is the assumption is, in this discussion, is that we know what sin is. Right. That seems to be an issue, even within the church. It's, and it seems to be an issue in the book of, of Galatians. It's not going to be other places. Um, <clears throat> One of the things, I don't know if you caught in the video, he talked about messy church being a big discussion. He's tapping into a discussion that you're not privy to in church growth circles. Um, we talk about messy church and that somewhere along the line, um, 1940s, 1950s, we got used to people just leaving the foxholes and the trenches of World War II, coming home, getting married, having kids and bringing them all to church. It was sort of like, and, you know, World War II, in a lot of ways, for a lot of a lot of guys, was an Emmaus Road experience. You know, if you if you get me out of the foxhole and you get me home, um, when I was growing up, there were more than one gentleman who had served 
in the church I grew up in who had served in World War II. And uh, I remember a guy, uh, they were caught in a monsoon. And that was his story. And he was in the Navy and he had lashed himself to the ship so that he would not be blown up. I'm not sure what he was doing outside the ship in the middle of a monsoon, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and he's not around so I can ask him. But uh, he clutched to the to the service Bible that was in his coat and he and God had some serious conversations, okay? So they came back and came to church and everybody came to church and they stayed to church because they brought um, the whole concept of, of, of military life with them. They brought discipline, they brought consistency. They, you know, regular church attendance for them was pretty much whenever the door was open, whenever the church needed anything, they were there. It wasn't any of this stuff like you know, we've got now where people figure they're regular if they show up once a month or so. Or, you know, when you sit down with a pastor and say, I'm having trouble with my kid and, and you know, it's your fault and the church's fault. Where have you been? And it's like, well, if you gave me your kid for more than an hour every month, then maybe we could, you know, maybe do, do some more. I think we're doing pretty good considering you give your kid to us for an hour a month. But... After World War II, it wasn't like that. And so we got used to that. And we got used to doing things by committees. We got used to having everything in its place and everybody doing what they were told. And we've moved to an era where, uh, where I consider the post-Christian era in America. Um, if you doubt that it's post-Christian America, you just need to turn your television on this week uh, and, and take a look and you will be reminded that we are in post-Christian America. And how we handle things is um, not to love your neighbor. It's just, let me just say, you don't smash the windows out of their store while you're loving them, okay? It just doesn't, doesn't work that way. You also don't put your knee on somebody's throat for eight minutes when you're loving them. That's, that's loving them to death. So I think it comes down on both sides. Um, we just, we don't use that prescription anymore. Um, it's not the kind of culture that we are in. Um, <clears throat> and so when those folks come to church and they don't know anything and they are anywhere, we are more like Paul in Corinth. So to your point, nobody knows what good moral behavior is. Nobody knows the difference between right and wrong. Nobody has inculcated in their lives a traditional uh, Judeo-Christian background anymore or very little. So when you get to church, you're working with the same kinds of things, I think, that Paul is working with in Galatia, and especially in Corinth. I always keep thinking about Corinth. The, the church that Paul um, probably loved the most and, and gave him ulcers at night and kept him up at night because of all the stuff that was going on there. Um, so I think I, I think we're, we're doing the messy church thing. And the problem with, you, with, it, with Galatians, if you just do Galatians, Paul doesn't get real specific on how you know um, how you know what, what's right and what's wrong. Where does your moral code come from? In Galatians, as far as we get, is that the Spirit will, will lead you into all truth, you know, which is the Gospel of John. But it's also, also Paul here. That your unity comes from the Spirit. Your freedom comes from the Spirit. And the Spirit will safeguard that freedom so it doesn't become licensed. Now, Paul's going to get very specific in other letters. Then he's going to begin to talk about the law of Christ as opposed to the law of Moses. But that's not the issue he's addressing here. He's not um, addressing, um, I want to say moral reprobates because I think what he's addressing is, um, is, is pretty horrendous. I think he thinks it's pretty horrendous. But it's not, it's not a, um, a list of what you or I would probably consider immediate immoral behavior. He's ad addressing people who, having been freed by Christ, want to go back under the yoke of the law. They don't want to have to struggle with what's right and what's wrong. Um, they can just go to the Mosaic law and if they do it all, then they're, then they're good to go. Um, but that isn't even right. So um, the next one I have here is the keepers. This keeps our hearts humble and gentle toward our erring sisters or brothers. Uh, if we stay in tune with Christ and in tune with the Holy Spirit, um, De Silva is going to suggest to you that that will keep our hearts humble. And I think that that is the sin that Paul talks about in the first two verses. Um, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. 
keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted. And the question is, what are you going to be tempted with? Obviously, not the sin that they're committing. What you may be tempted to do is to think more highly of yourself than you ought to be thinking. And it may be the whole pride thing, the whole thing where you set yourself up as God to judge as opposed to a brother or sister in Christ who loves and bears one another's burdens. There's a huge difference um, in, in the perspective. Um, carrying someone else's luggage was the work of a slave in the ancient world, uh, which we're back to that phrase, of carrying each other's burdens. Carrying someone else's luggage was the work of a slave when one was available. Doing so voluntarily, Paul, I think, wants to tell us, is a burden of love. And, and Paul makes yet another allusion to slavery. And once again, I know that that's a hot topic at the moment. And, and maybe we shouldn't use it because it comes with all, all that baggage um, that is out there right now. But on the other hand, um, it's, it's a scandalous image. And I think Paul wants it to be scandalous. We are, we are asked, you and I, um, white skin color and all, are asked to be slaves. Um, slaves of love and carry love's burden as, as though uh, that were the case. So uh, I think that's all from the first, first couple of verses. As uh, we move over to verses three through six, well, I have listed at the middle, about the middle of 87, beginning of the last paragraph, honor is an important value in Paul's culture and people lay claim to honor. Paul wants to make sure here that Christians lay claim to honor rightly. And it's based first, not first on our own work. It is not based on our imagined superiority to another person whose burden we are too important to help carry. And what three through six says is, for if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Uh, today's worries carry enough for themselves. Um, I think where Paul is going to go, he's going to circle the wagon at the very end of this chapter and come around with that. And uh, Paul is living in an honor-based culture, which is going to be very foreign to us. When we see somebody who claims honor, the first thing we're going to think is that they are prideful. Uh, and there is a certain amount of respect that you are entitled to if you have done the work, if the credit is yours, then you stand up and you take that honor. Um, I think when you get to the end of the chapter, what Paul is talking about is um, the honor that comes at the end of all things. Uh, that you, that the honor that you get is a salvation which Christ gives in the final judgment. Um, and that is the honor that we're worried about, not um, one-upsmanship or being, being better than somebody else. Rather, it is likely that he is thinking about our having a claim to honor in the last days. Um, if you're after scripture references, that sort of cross-references, uh, 2 Corinthians 1.14 would be one place. Philippians 2.16 would be another. And uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.19. Are you, are you right? Or, you got that, right? Okay. Um, so I just, I think that that's, that's kind of important. So I'm over on 89 and I'm kind of in the middle at the end of the first full paragraph. Uh, we cannot continue to make room for the flesh under the guise of Christian freedom without consequences. If we tell ourselves otherwise, we are simply deceiving ourselves. <clears throat> what Paul is assuming, and he doesn't flesh it out, pun intended, sorry, um, is you know what we all want is we want that list of specific behaviors. Uh, and he doesn't give it to us in Galatians. But what he's saying is if, if we continue um, giving in to the passions of the flesh, then what's going to happen is that you head down a road. Um, you're, you're never at a stop in Christianity. You are always headed either one way or the other. That's a, a, a very basic um, Old Testament understanding of the word uh, to save, which is shuv, which is to turn. You either turn towards God and head towards God, or you are facing away from God and you are heading away from God. You're doing one thing or the other. You, you are never standing still. Um, and I think that's one of the things that Paul wants to wants to uh, bring to us in, in verses 7 through 10. Um, the assurance of the outcome, the harvest of eternal life, life 
should suffice to overcome any weariness in thus investing oneself. I did that one just because of where we all are. Um, I'm weary, you're weary, we're all weary. We're tired of watching the television, we are tired of watching burning uh, buildings burn, we are tired of watching people die of COVID. We are just tired of uh, ugliness and then on top of that, we get a presidential campaign, which is about the ugliest thing that we do as Americans. Um, so you get weary and, and you get tired. You don't get to see anybody. You don't get to talk to your friends. And one of the assurances that Paul leaves with his, uh, with his readers of his letter is uh, that the presence of the spirit is sufficient. It is sufficient for us in our weariness. And the question we have to ask ourselves is whether we believe that, whether we claim that, and how and where do we claim that? If I had my group here that tonight, we would talk about where you claim that. We talked about that a little bit last week. That where you claim that, I think, is in your prayer life and, and opening yourself up to the Spirit and allowing the Spirit to come in and renew your spirit. <laughs> I think I think we we're pretty pretty clear on that. Um, it all comes back to that: what you sow is what you reap, and Christianity is not fire insurance. Never was, never will be. Um, it is a journey. Uh, it is a journey that you take with the Holy Spirit, and you open yourself to that Spirit, and are renewed and refreshed and reformed into the image of Christ. So we are almost done. Um, verses 11, 13. I already did that one. So that, um, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. This is really complicated stuff, I guess. There's a lot of diversity in opinion. Um, so, in ancient uh, in, in ancient Rome, there was a list of religions that um, were allowed, and I forget what the name of it is, and I apologize for that. Um, that you could practice under Roman law, and then there was everything else. And everything else, you were, you know, if you weren't on the list, you weren't free to practice. Kicker is, is that Judaism is on the list, okay? Christianity is not on the list. So what happens at the beginning of Christianity is everybody's Jewish, everybody's practicing Judaism, everybody looks Jewish. Now, I'm not going to see, I have no idea who's going to check to see whether you're circumcised or not, whether you're Jewish or not, all that kind of stuff. But one of the main concerns is as the church becomes more and more Gentile, as they begin to experience the freedom that Paul talks about, the freedom in Christ that surpasses the law and fulfills it and allows them to go to a better place, they look less and less Jewish. Well, the problem is if you are Jewish, that puts you at risk because you're hanging with a non-certified religion in Rome. And if you aren't certified by Rome, then you're up for persecution. And Paul kind of hits the nail on the head as he leaves this and says, the end of the sixth chapter, what these guys are really interested in is not suffering for Christ. They don't want to be counted as Christians. They want to be seen as Jews by the Roman government so they don't have to suffer. So they don't have to suffer for their faith. And they really don't care about you. And they're not really concerned about your future. What they're really concerned about is making sure that you look like and sound like Jews so that they will not be hassled and persecuted just like the early Christians will be later. So I just thought I would throw that out there. Um, That's all that complicated stuff. So I think that that is everything that I had that I wanted to cover with you. I'm sorry if I got going a little fast. Um, that's the New Yorker in me. It comes out every once in a while. I move a little quicker. I will 
uh, always remember when we had uh, folks from Western New York come down to do summer mission camp with us. And uh, I had been down here, what, let's see, one, two, three, four, maybe four, four six years. And uh, so they came down and um, they worked faster, spoke faster, did everything faster, and they were five times as loud as everybody else. And I thought, my, how, how we endure, how, you know, how we adapt to things uh, in Southern culture. Uh, one of them is uh, the, the lack of need for blood pressure medicine. I just, I don't know how they, how they did that, how they kept and just this constant flurry of activity. And you just wanted to tell them to just relax. So I apologize, some of that probably crept in tonight as I just got going, um, so. But that is it, any questions before we leave Galatians? So um, what I'm going to attempt to do um, is I'm hoping when we come back, we're going to do um, a new members class. I want to call it confirmation class. But we have a couple of uh, youth who, who are ready for confirmation if that's what they choose. So I would like to do kind of a basic uh, Christian beliefs Bible study and, and walk us through the basics. It's always a good thing, especially since we live in, as I pointed out, a post-Christian culture. It's important for us to understand the basics and be able to talk about the basics in a language that other people will understand. Uh, if you are attempting to convince people of something and you use one set of words or one set of actions and it elicits a totally different response, then chances are you should probably choose a, a different medium to communicate with people. Okay, so. We'll close with prayer, and it'll be a shorter session tonight because uh, we're just the production crew tonight, so let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that you have made us free in Christ, and you have challenged us through the words of Paul to walk with the Holy Spirit. So often we relegate the Spirit to um, someplace outside of Christendom. We uh, give it all to Jesus, as the song says, and we... Don't always talk about the work of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. May we be challenged. May we be challenged to understand that it is the Holy Spirit that brings the work of Christ to us. It is the Holy Spirit that Paul tells us transforms our very lives, that keeps us on the path that we should go, um, that turns us into people who reflect and imitate uh, the image of Jesus Christ. We give you thanks. And we ask that your spirit would pour out upon us that we might be your messengers in the world, that you might revive our spirits, revive the spirits of all those who are around us, that a revival might come through the power and the wonder and the working of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.